this is Yesterzine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. We take a magazine from the golden age, play the games they liked most and least, and flip through to find out what gaming was like, when not only did Sega make consoles, they were making about 30 of them. It's mid-1994, and we dive into Mean Machine Sega, issue 23, to encounter new games for the Mega Drive, Mega CD, Game Gear, and Master System. The news section promises the first shots from Sega's 32X, and of course we're already within a year of the Saturn's US launch. And that's not to mention other Mega Drive variants like the handheld Nomad, the portable CD player for bodybuilders called the Multimega, and the JVC produced Wonder Mega, about which we should talk sometime, because JVC made four models of the bloody thing despite it pretty much being the world's worst idea. In the magazine though, all three games we're about to look at are resolutely home console cartridge affairs. The Gaming Heaven is considered a standout 16-bit RPG, but isn't really one of the more famous ones. The Gaming Hell is a licensed driving title whose previous PC version is one of my childhood favourites, and might provide a cautionary tale for the driving games of today. And the cover feature you'll already know if you're an incredible nerd who has so far paid complete attention to this episode. And while you ponder what you missed, it's time to boot up the Mega Drive. If we talk Sega RPGs, there's only really one super famous one, Fantasy Star, a series with three entries on the Mega Drive and which is still just about running today. But there's one more that you'd be forgiven for not even having heard of despite it running for just as long. And if you're a certain shark watching this, you're already screaming at the screen because we're talking about the series known simply as Shining. But if you're an English language Mega Drive gamer, Shining Force. But first let's deal with someone else's poor research. In this case, Mean Machines themselves. Their review describes this as the sequel to Sonic Team's original Shining Force game of 1991. You may well be thinking, Weren't Sonic Team rather busy in 1991, writing a little game called Sonic the Hedgehog? And yes, yes they were, which is why they didn't write Shining Force. And in any case, Shining Force wasn't released until 1992. Or 93, if like me machines, you live in the UK. So that's gone well. It's vaguely understandable though. Shining Force 1 and 2 were written by an unrelated company called Sonic Software Planning, who were indeed named after Sonic the Hedgehog, but have never been involved in a Sonic game. Which is probably why they renamed themselves to Camelot before starting an association with one of Sonic's mates. 14 Mario Golf, Tennis and Sports games later, Camelot are firmly considered a Nintendo studio, even if they're still officially independent. Hell, they created Waluigi. But they were originally set up as a Sega first party studio, and have written games published by Sony as well. They've been there and done it. But as we join them in 1994, they're Sega owned, and Shining Force 2 is a not so well known but much loved RPG produced under a surprising amount of pressure as the fifth Shining game overall. If Mean Machine Sega are to be believed, a 91% review suggests they succeeded. I've never played it. Let's take a look together. The 8 minute intro is, to put it mildly, comprehensive. As a group of mercenaries doing some tomb raiding discover a hidden room in a shrine, and having not done a lot of reading as children, go storming right in to discover some jewels just sitting there out in the open. Back in the castle, the king senses trouble or just doesn't like storms, it's not made entirely clear. Remember folks, keep your king safe and inside on fireworks night. Back to the plot, it turns out those were supporting jewels, and the thieves run off with them as the shrine collapses around them, and the king notices his man cave, known as the ancient tower, appears to be having a bad time of it, something he should have realised when the builder sold it to him as unsinkable. And at the very least, the sealed door is now only 50% accurately named. The guards run off to check, with the inevitable result of the king being attacked by what I'm fairly certain is grot bags. The interactive portion of this endeavour picks up the story the next morning, but first there's the traditional character creation. 
No, please. Data One is my father's name. Call me One. Or rather, because my commitment to a running gag is total and unshakable, call me ENRPG. The game, also unusually for a Japanese RPG, offers you difficulty levels. I choose Normal, which the game immediately calls Easy once I select it. Way to hurt my feelings, Shining Force 2. The game starts the morning after the night before and joins our hero doing his morning bed exercises. What, you don't go for a bed jog every morning? H how else would you start your day? The first portion of the game is pure JRPG. We have generic exposition with today's nominated family member, and then we go immediately rampaging over town, bursting into homes where everyone greets us exactly like you wouldn't greet a home invader. Nice to see them doing their bed jogging too though. Everyone is apparently fond of our teacher Sir Astral and the King, and they're not shy about telling us this despite the fact that presumably we go to school every day so it's not like it's news to us. We also find our first interesting location, the church. The church is where you will do your saving, and it's also where you'll be resurrected to if you fail miserably. And if you've seen this series before, you'll know that's going to happen, so more on that later. Nonetheless, we save, because never pass up an opportunity to save. They won't let us into the castle, which is a shame because all I wanted was to buy some Grand Seal. It does exactly what it says on the pail. Instead, we accept the inevitable and realise the game is not going to let us do anything fun until we go to school. Thankfully, this doesn't last long. The teacher gets called to the castle, where the king is still suffering the after effects of his hard night of being in the intro. We decide to follow along, because otherwise this really is not going to be much of a game. Personally, I'd have stayed behind in the school and taken the chance to get some quality Zelda time in. The worst palace guards in the world let us straight in based on us saying a random visitor to the castle wants to see us. And before we go to meet him, we do of course explore the place, indulge in a little light ransacking, and invade a woman's bedroom. As you do. Anyway, some story happens, which leads us to go investigate the secret tower only the king is allowed into. And it's there we encounter the unique selling point of this game among its peers, the combat system. As you can see, we're not just doing the typical Final Fantasy or Fantasy Star, or some other game with a third way of spelling fantasy here. It's not just turn-based attack and defend combat. What it is, to use a modern parlance, is XCOM the RPG. You move your people around and then can attack anyone within range, or alternatively hunker down and hide for a turn. In the case of our party right now, this is tricky. Neither us nor the ghosts have any ranged weapons, so we can only attack each other like a couple of toddlers having a slap fight. The only spell Ian appears to have is the one that transports him back to the church, and I think you've detected we'll be back there anyway soon enough. This might be my incompetence or me missing a nuance to a game I do not have a manual to, but the tit for tat doing of 3 damage while they apparently ignore Sir Teacher means my party leader dies pretty quick and I get dumped back at the church. All is not lost though, because Shining Force has a concession to us here. You keep the XP you've earned in the fight so far, so Sarah is already level 2 and thus a bit more powerful. At the very least I'm going to be able to grind this fight out rather than be utterly trapped, and for your convenience, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. And indeed the third time through it's almost easy, and then shit goes down as Ghost Dude goes to have his way with the King. Astral, having done shit all in the fight, suddenly has a range of powerful spells to utilise and there's a quick exorcism. I want that spell. Astral is downed by the one brief period of exercise he's bothered to do all day, and the King responds by solving the mystery of where the UK government got its Covid policy from. He also decides that what the Kingdom needs is to ignore the 11 billion armed guards in his castle and instead sends a bunch of untrained underage teen school students on the difficult mission to find the one man who can apparently help. I'm not sure I like this guy that much. In any case, we stop off for the essentials like buying some fancy new weapons and petting the kitty. Recruit our late sleeping friend Jahar the War to join us and set off. And it's here I largely sour on the game. We're dumped into another immediate high level encounter where we only have the one ranged weapon, Chester's new spear. The enemies, even on this easiest mode, eat half our health, 
and we damage them a variable and generally lower amount. Even with Sarah's heal spell and a small pile of healing plants, it does not seem fair. Running also does not appear to be an option. At this point, I've rather decided I've had enough for me personally, but I wanted to show you a little more. The game has other ideas. When you die, you get returned to the church, and by coincidence, both times it was Ian RPG who died in the previous battle, and as leader of the party, he resets the whole thing. If you lose others first, they need to be resurrected at the church. This costs money. I have very little, and I can't afford to do both of them. I'm done. I want to like this. With some ranged weapons, this story seems really interesting, but I'm not constantly grinding encounters this early on, on the easiest difficulty to level up. It's just not for me. I always hate a game too, where its reaction to you failing is to actively make the game more difficult. In this case, by making you pay money you should be spending on weapons and heals, just to get back in the game. It's weird, given how sensibly friendly it was with the XP. The idea of an RPG adventure with XCOM battle mechanics is solid, and indeed Ubisoft have implemented it very successfully with Mario Rabbids Kingdom Battle, which I'm suddenly suspicious Camelot might have had a hand in. If you've seen all this, think you'll like it, and somehow haven't encountered Shining before, go right ahead. But for me it's just too impenetrable and unfriendly, which is a damn shame for an expansive game with tremendous ideas and style. Ah oh well, everything can't be for everyone. Lemmings, a classic puzzle game that was converted to everything, debuting in 1991 when the number of viable formats was massive and then having a long life afterwards. There are, deep breath, official versions of Lemmings 4. Amiga, MS-DOS, Classic Macos, Atari ST, ZX Spectrum, Amiga CD TV, Acorn Archimedes, PC-98, FM Towns, Sharp X68000, Apple 2GS, SNES, TurboGrafx CD, Sega Genesis, Game Gear, Amstrad CPC, Master System, NES, Commodore 64, 3DO, Atari Lynx, Sam Coupe, Game Boy, Philips CDI, Amiga CD32, Microsoft Windows, PlayStation, and any number of crappy Java phones. Originally produced by later Grand Theft Auto creators DMA Design for Psygnosis, the ports went everywhere, leading to weird situations like Ocean doing versions for NES and Game Boy, but only publishing the latter, leaving Sunsoft to distribute it on NES alongside their own SNES and Mega Drive versions. The Master System was past its distribution outside the PAL territories by this point, so there's no worldwide publisher, and Sega took it upon themselves to produce this rather smart version for their 8-bits in 1992. The conversion was outsourced to the specialists at Probe, who often got more out of the SMS than should have been possible. Nonetheless, the Master System version is not without compromise. There's no screen resolution for a map, and the number of lemmings both on screen and thus required to finish a level are reduced. But basically, it's all right here. But we're not technically here to talk about lemmings. I said you could have already worked out the feature here, and if you cast your eyes over the cover, you'll notice that this month's Mean Machine Sega has a preview of Lemmings 2. By then, we already knew Lemmings 2. Subtitled The Tribes, the basic gameplay loop was the same, but the Lemmings have split into two tribes, each with their own set of eight skills. With some in common, the number overall has risen from 8 to 51. In a neat twist, each tribe starts with a number of Lemmings, and rather than get an allocation for each level, you get whoever you saved from the previous ones. It's a nice little innovation, demanding both replayability and making it harder to get stuck. The game was, slated, to come out for Mega Drive later that year, and it was indeed delivered by digital developments to some fantastic reviews, including a 93% from Mega that may require us to look at it properly these days as a gaming heaven. But it's not the Mega Drive version we're here for. The cover, in the absence of anything else to put for the system this month, specifically promised us Lemmings 2 on the Master System, and delivers with a little corner in the Mega Drive preview. With Probe busy performing minor miracles to cram this version of Mortal Kombat 2 onto the old Master Saster, the conversion was handled by Spidersoft, normally a byword for cacking things up royally. And signs aren't super wonderful. Main programmer Matt Taylor was shortly to be part of the team that somehow managed to take the beautiful Pinball Fantasies engine 
and make their sequel both demand a 32-bit Amiga and be awful in every single way. There is only one review of Lemmings 2 on the Mars system as far as I can tell, and that's in issue 60 of Sega Power. It takes the innovative approach of mocking the reader for still being interested in Mars system games and provides exactly no specific details about the version other than the startling revelation it lacks some of the detail of the Mega Drive. Sega Power really wasn't that great a magazine, was it? I'm glad we had them all killed during the 73% trials. There's a reason, though, for such paucity of reviews. The Mars System, and indeed Game Gear versions, were never released. So this review is all we have, although as Matt himself later pointed out, most of the code was reused for the surprisingly solid Game Boy version, which CVG rated higher than they did the Mega Drive one. Nonetheless, that's what this feature is here to highlight. A lost gem which we may never get the means to sample ourselves, and is lost to the mists of, oh of course not, I wouldn't do that to you. Matt Taylor was smart enough to keep said code. In conjunction with SMS Power 20 years later, he was also lovely enough to release said code. You are indeed now watching the Mars System version of Lemmings 2, and if you like, you can go to SMS Power right after this presentation and download it, and the Game Gear version. I'll link it in the description. Call it a Yesterzine cover disc. But should you bother? Well, let's take a look. First impressions are astonishingly good. This one was not thrown together. The intro is here, lasting four minutes if you let it, telling the story of how the Lemmings split into their 12 tribes, but now need to come back together in order to do, you know, story stuff. The cut down on this game isn't in the levels either. It has the same 10 for each tribe that the big boy versions have. And as implied earlier, this is great. On Lemmings 1, if you get stuck on level 2, then you're pretty much stuck on level 2. You could try the harder difficulty levels, but they're even harder. And if you're stuck on level 2, you're probably pre-boned. Here, you'd have to get stuck on 12 levels of comparable difficulty before you were completely doomed. And by that point, there's probably very little helping you. The one major limitation becomes obvious starting a level. You only get 8 lemmings maximum. It's a simple decision, but one that's a masterstroke for more than one reason. Firstly, it means there's no huge tricks needed to get the thing running. It stays within the standard sprites on a line limit of the master system. But secondly, it actually makes this an interesting version in its own right. With some levels redesigned to fit, some clever use of indestructible blocks, and fewer lemmings to keep track of, this is a marginally easier version than most. But, that difficulty easing comes mostly in the form of fewer moving things to keep track of, rather than explicitly the puzzle difficulty. It's mostly removing control difficulty, rather than puzzle difficulty. And that's actually a really good thing for a puzzle game. There's nothing more annoying than knowing exactly what you want to do, and then failing because you can't highlight the right lemming or move the cursor quick enough. With just the eight lems, and possibly less if you kill some early on, a lot of these problems are removed. Given the Mars System's user base would absolutely have skewed younger by 1994, then regardless of technical limitations, it's a smart move to make with the title. Especially on the Game Gear version, which as you can see here, is further constrained a little by the lower resolution of the handheld disaster. Programmer Matt Taylor talked about that eight lemming limit. Lemmit around the time he released the game. The maximum number of lemmings was a conundrum at the start of development. I looked into pure background map animation, a blend of that and sprites, and just sprites. I believe in Lemmings 1 they have some kind of funky sprite multiplexing going on to get 16, but in the end I decided that the number of lemmings wasn't actually that important in terms of gameplay, as the aim of the game was unchanged. So I stuck with 8 to reduce complexity, sprite flickering and processing time. I had also noticed that many of the levels just involve sending one or two lemmings off across the map to get to a point where they can rescue the rest. So having 8 lemmings or 60 lemmings didn't affect gameplay. Managing those lems becomes even more important than on the big boy versions because there's so many fewer of them. Here I kill all but one in a butchered route 1 attempt to finish a level. The next one you absolutely couldn't finish with one lemming, and so I'm stuck. Thankfully, you can always go back and re-attempt a level, 
and the game will give you a password for your current overall situation after each and every attempt, meaning that this is a game you can enjoy in a 5 minute play session. Especially a boon on the Game Gear, where you'll probably have to stop at that point to charge it anyway. The only portable electronics that use batteries quicker than a Game Gear are owned by your mum. You should play this version, even if just to boot up in an emulator and gawk. If you've got a portable emulation device, pick one of them to take with you. The Game Gear version has some slight technical benefits, but of course lower resolution. Both though are superior to play in 2021 than their released SEP sister on the Game Boy, for reasons that should be obvious to you. If either had been released in 1994, they may not have made any money, Psygnosis certainly didn't think so. But they would have reviewed well, and been sought after now. In reality, thanks to Matt's generosity and hoarding skills, you can have it for free a quarter of a century later, and I've confirmed it works absolutely fine on hardware, near hardware, and emulators. Go play yourself some Lost History. There are people whose name transcends their sport. I'd venture you've heard of David Beckham, even if you've never watched a minute of football. Andy Murray in tennis. Mike Tyson, the boxist. Usain Bolt, the runnist. Motor racing has a few for us Brits. Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, Nigel Mansell, Sterling Moss are all names where the average person will at least say, oh yes, they're a racist. Wait, that came out wrong. In America, that name is Andretti, a whole family of racers for whom the term diminishing returns was invented. But Mario Andretti in Jaws, a world champion in F1 and IndyCar, one of only two drivers to ever win races in both of those, the World Sports Car Championship and NASCAR. He's somehow still the last American to win a Formula 1 race. He won professional motor races in five different decades before retiring in 1994. At the age of 81, he still drives the incredibly rapid two-seater IndyCar at events. And being relatively forward-thinking in the 80s and 90s, he licensed some games. Viewers of this channel may remember one, the PC-based Mario Andretti's Racing Challenge a career mode game from the creators of Test Drive and Need for Speed, which suffered a little from late 80s PC tech and only four cars in the races. Still, one of the first credible attempts to stuff multiple types of racing into the same game. Distinctive Software brought that license to Electronic Arts when they were purchased around that time, and while DSi started work on a little game called FIFA International Soccer, EA handed the Mario license to other EA Sports royalty, Stormfront Studios, members of whom would later be responsible for the Madden and NHL games. The Mega Drive title would be called Mario Andretti Racing, and the title wasn't the only thing they slimmed down for console. Six disciplines falls to three, as we combine the Dirt series, the two open wheels, and lose the Le Mans prototypes. The game credits Mario Andretti for strategy, and thanks his racing driver son Jeff too. It's always difficult to know if these kinds of things are marketing bollocks, but it bodes well. What bodes less well is the review in this issue, because you should know now it's 33%. So okay, let's take a look. For the uninitiated, indie cars you might as well think of as Formula 1. It's close enough. Very, very fast single-seaters that race primarily on what the Americans call road courses and you would just call a track. Stock cars and NAS cars, big, heavy, fast road-style cars that race mostly on oval tracks but sometimes on road courses. And sprint cars, well I'm just going to need to show you sprint cars. Tiny, powerful, stupid dirt oval things that are fantastic entertainment and probably a tad more dangerous than actually makes any sense. It's there we start, and immediately we discover this thing has physics. There is some sense of trying to make the game feel like it's a car on dirt. It's a unique driving style, which essentially means being comfortable with considerably more looking out the side of the car than is traditional. And in the game too, you turn in and somehow they've contrived on a system with a digital controller and no rumble to make you really feel like the back has just chucked itself out. You need to manage these slides, and it's a genuinely fun and engaging driving game based on the driving model alone at this point, which is pretty rare for the era. You can absolutely spin out if you're doing it wrong, but the game is kind to you when you do, 
it wants you to do better. I've played a lot of this game now, and I've not managed to have a race ending crash in any mode. It's just spin, lose some time, get back to it. And that's how it should be. Dust yourself down and try again. Moving to the race, there's another neat little feature. The game starts split screen, but you can change to full screen if you like. I actually don't. You can make use of the fact the second screen is dynamic. You can see it from a competitor if you like, but more usefully can have a reference third person view or a rear view from your own car to check for competitors, or how close you are to spinning. Most often though, I left it on the map view. It's only semi-relevant for these ovals, but in a racing game from this era where scenery is constrained by technology, on a road course it's very useful to check where you are at a glance. The wiki entry charmingly suggests without source that Mario Andretti personally guided the development of the AI. We can't begin to evaluate that, and it's hard to believe that Mario has a computer science degree. But there's certainly some smarts to the thing. Take my next race. We graduate to stock cars and choose to stay on an oval. We end up in a race-long slipstreaming battle that only ends because I completely forget fuel is a thing and have to crawl back to the pits on fumes. I emerge fifth and very, very nearly retake third on the last straight. I often express that driving games and racing games are two different things, and it's a very rare game that can get them both right if they even try. Gran Turismo, for instance, is absolutely a driving game in single player. It even tells you so right on the box. Project Cars 1 and 2, while ostensibly sims, are well off the best of their genre for pure driving. But as someone who's done some racing, nothing has ever felt more like being in a real race, as Project Cars 2 does at its best. To find a 16-bit game doing a credible job of both is impressive. We take the chance to try a road circuit, specifically the Smoky Valley, legally distinct from the real New York circuit Watkins Glen. The realistic understeer physics of the NASCAR on the oval are transferred, but you get a surprisingly good sense of weight. These are heavy cars, even down to a tendency to squirm under braking. It gives us a chance to notice how this game moves, that is an exceptional frame rate, albeit helped by being quite stingy with the detail. Tyres and fuel are even more of a thing here. The longer track means the three laps qualifying uses most of the fuel. Missing the pits here would be race ending compared to the small penalty we got at that oval. And we have another fun race, interrupted late on by slamming into a car the AI spun on its own. Again, the computer cars are raceable. The collision detection is the one thing letting it down a bit. The car's hitboxes appear to be larger than the cars themselves, and that has to be adjusted for. There's one more car type to try, the Indy cars, and we start with one of the more interesting features of the game, Mario's Track Guides, where you drive the circuit alongside what passes for the narration of a guide. At this simple track, which I want to be clear is totally not Long Beach in California, it's useful, but possibly a smidge too advanced for a 1994 digital control game? It'd help you learn a track, but I think the lack of scenery means the map is always going to be a must on a road course. Weirdly, despite IndyCar's schedule including the most famous oval race in the world, the Indianapolis 500, the roster in this game is all road courses. And again we have a fun race, spending a lot of it swapping positions with cars just about as fast as us. In so many games, including the aforementioned Gran Turismo, Cars are often just mobile chicanes for you to fight from the back to the front of. Not many games on the 16 bits tried to make them raceable in any fashion, but this does. And combined with the game's credibly lax approach to car to car collisions, there aren't many games on the system doing it as convincingly. You can go and do a proper championship in any of these three, which is a simple qualify if you want and then do a short race on each track affair. But the meat of the game is career mode, and career mode is hard. You start with a slow car, and have to upgrade the engine, tyres and brakes using the money you win. But of course, you have to win that money using the crappy car you start with. It's realistic, but it's the one time I sort of understand the review scores, because there is a commitment here. You have to be comfortable with the fact you're going to struggle to finish anywhere other than the bottom half, at least initially. Especially as the bigger tracks demand more from your engine. That said, even finishing last immediately gives you the money to upgrade the tyres to the first level, 
which will make a big difference on a dirt track. One note of caution, the game uses passwords as a save system and I recommend you take a picture every single race, because press one wrong button and the game quits to menu without any warning, resetting your career progress. It's a fantastically stupid bug I fell foul of once myself, thankfully early in the career. Minus that bug though, all this leads us to ask is how MMS came to the conclusion of 33%. And we don't have to wait long. The very first part of Paul's conclusion is your answer. Oh dearie dearie me, Andretti Racing is such a virtual wannabe. It's what now? By this they mean Virtua Racing, a Sega arcade machine that had recently received a £70 version on the Mega Drive, essentially because they put half a new console in the cartridge to get the thing running, an option incidentally unavailable to EA even if they'd wanted it. But the point is, that's an arcade racer, in a literal sense. If I may break for a rant, driving and racing games are not really a genre. 2D platformers can mostly be at least semi-sensibly compared. But an arcade driving game is a very different prospect to something more serious. If Mean Machine Sega were expecting wide open tracks, cars that obligingly get out of your way, and games that are over in five minutes, then they were always on a hiding to nothing with this time sink. They also fundamentally failed to understand what it was trying to do. I'm not trying to knock Virtua Racing, although these days it's not that Mega Drive version you want to play. But it feels fair to point out the frame rate and draw distance of Andretti is something that the arcade game can only dream about on Mega Drive. You wouldn't review Shining Force and then complain the fighting was less exciting than Streets of Rage, and you shouldn't play this and be surprised it's not a coin-up conversion. They've simply got the wrong end of the stick on what this game is trying to do. And given it's a comprehensive racing game named after and produced with the assistance of a real life racing driver, then they really should have. Should you play this? Well, you already know. If your only interest in racing games is stuff like Virtua Racing, then no, this is not for you, no shame in that. But if your horizons are even remotely broader, if you, for instance, enjoyed the career modes of the Super Monaco Grand Prix games on Mega Drive, then this is almost the blowout third part to that trilogy, with better physics, a better career path, and better racing. I'll leave the last words to Mario himself in the back of the box, which I think should have served as a clue to the game's intent. The thing I admire in a race driver is versatility. The ability to take any car on any kind of track in any kind of race and do well with it against anyone. On the back page, a place I need to visit myself. If you're in the Lower Midlands, finally there's a reason to visit Milton Keynes, the Pixel Bunker, a free play arcade run by some of the same folks that run your favourite, or least favourite, retro expos. Featuring tens of machines for a simple time boxed entry fee, I'll be there myself in the next month, and we should all support the very existence of arcades while there are still some to support. And while I get ready for that, you hit some buttons. Ideally ones attached to this video, and consider a free subscription to Yesterzine, available the last Friday of every month. Tara.